Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Miketz, we learned that there was an intense famine in the land. Jacob gathered his sons and charged them with a mission to go buy grain in Egypt, not knowing that his son Joseph was in charge of Egypt and had just rescued Egypt from a famine. We read, when Jacob saw that there was grain being sold in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? Unquote. What does this strange phrase mean? There are many interpretations. Rashi and the Ramban say it means, what are you waiting for? Why aren't you out already looking for food? But then what's the reason for informing us of that? Sforno says it means, why are you looking at one another as if each one of you expects another of you to go buy the food? Remember that our sages said, too many cooks spoil the broth. In other words, when more than one person is in charge, nobody is. There is indeed a teaching there. Perhaps it means that their condition was so dire that they felt dumb, numb and froze in place. The Midrash says it means, since you're strong and handsome, do not stand together in one place, lest the evil eye prevail upon you, unquote. In other words, I don't want to lose you all at once. Along the same lines, the Talmud tells us it means, quote, do not show yourselves when you're satiated before the house of Esau or the house of Ishmael, so that they not be jealous of you, considering they suffer from hunger. This teaches that one should not show he is full when others are hungry, unquote. In other words, don't show off your blessings to those who don't enjoy the same. This explanation became the dominant one, although it's not obvious from the text, which assumes that Jacob's clan was also suffering. The Shulchan Aruch codified it into law. Quote, if you go from a place when, where they are not fasting to a place where they are fasting, you should fast with them. If you forgot and eat and drink, you should not let yourself be seen, unquote. The Zohar goes so far as to say that even God is displeased when you flaunt your blessings. By provoking the envy of your neighbors, you also provoke heavenly judgments. This teaches that we must be sensitive and not flaunt what we have, if only for the sake of others who don't have what we have. Even though they should not be jealous, the pain they suffer when they see us is real. The rabbis of the Talmud maintained that the evil eye was involved in many biblical events. For example, Sarah cast an evil eye on Hagar while Hagar was pregnant, causing her to miscarry before becoming pregnant with Ishmael. The first set of tablets of the law was given to the Jews openly, so the evil eye prevailed upon them and they were smashed. But the second set of tablets was given in secret after God said to Moses in Exodus, quote, no one else shall come up with you and no one else shall be seen anywhere on the mountain. As a result, they were not destroyed. Rabbi Nubahia said, says, the power of the evil eye is so great that it can even interfere with miracles. Leah became subject to the power of the evil eye because the Torah says she thanked God for having allowed her to bear a fourth son and immediately after that, it says she stopped giving birth, unquote. The book of Numbers says, and Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel. Rashi says it means that he cast his evil eye on Israel, since God would not allow him to curse them openly as he wished. Joshua advised those enjoying good fortune to live in a forest to avoid the evil eye. Quote, Joshua said to them, if you're a great people, you should go up to the forest. The Talmud explains that it means go and hide in the forest so that the evil eye will not have dominion upon you since you're such a large number of people." Unquote. King Saul was jealous of the future King David and gave him an evil eye. Quote, from that day on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And it came to pass that David was successful in all his ways and the Lord, and the Lord was with him. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were thrown in a fiery furnace by the king of Babylon after they refused to bow before an idol. 
but God saved them. So the king, impressed, promoted them to high office. The Talmud says they later died as a result of the evil eye. Quote, where did these sages go after their miraculous deliverance? They are not mentioned anymore. Rav said they died as a result of the evil eye cast by people who were jealous of their deliverance, unquote. The evil eye, Ayn Hara, is an entrenched belief in Judaism. It is said to be an evil force generated by our evil inclination. The Talmud asserts flatly, damage caused by looking is also damage. This implies that you can harm by mere thoughts. Coveting is damaging even if no action results from it. The Talmud says, don't advertise your good fortune because this will cause envy, which will cause harm to fall on you. The sage, the sage Rav was said to enter cemeteries and determined that 99% of the people buried there died prematurely because an evil eye was cast on them. However, other rabbis in the Talmuds said this does not apply to Jews. For example, when a woman tried to cast a spell on Rabbi Hanina, he said, quote, try as you will, you will not succeed. For the Torah says, there is none besides gods. In another story, Rabbi Yohanan boasted about his beauty. The rabbi said to him, do, not, do you not fear the evil eye? He replied, I am of the seed of Joseph, against whom an evil eye is powerless, unquote. Is there a way to ward off the evil eye? The Talmud describes a ceremonial to do just that. Quote, one who enters a city and fears the evil eye should hold the thumb of his right hand in his left and the thumb of his left hand in his right and recite the following. I, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, come from the descendants of Joseph, over whom the evil eye has no dominion, unquote. Some Jews, when mentioning their good fortune, will add beliain hara, meaning without the evil eye, or kenahora, meaning let there be no evil eye. It's a Yiddish corruption of kenain hara. The response used to be to spit three times. Now it is to say ptu, 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 as standards of decency change. To ward off the evil eye, some Jews wear a blue pearl or, or a chamsa hand of Fatma, or tie red strings on their, their wrists. In Israel, some women perform for a fee a ceremony called evil eye removal. Some Talmudic rabbi believe that having daughters wards off the evil eye. Quote, Rabbi Hisda said, if a daughter is born first, it is a good sign for the children. Why? Some say it's because she rears her brothers. Others say it's because the evil eye has no influence over her, because a girl is not the subject of envy. To me, however, daughters are dearer than sons." Unquote. Maimonides, who hated every form of superstition with a passion, nevertheless makes allowances for, to set people's minds at ease. Quote, a person bitten by a scorpion or a serpent may whisper a charm over the wound even on Shabbat, in order to settle his mind and to strengthen his heart. The thing is of no avail whatsoever, but since he's in danger, he is permitted to do it since he won't feel, so he won't feel troubled." Unquote. The Mishnah even says that we must be careful not to cast the evil eye ourselves. Quote, Rabbi Yeshua said, the evil eye, the evil inclination and hatred of the creations remove a person from the world. An evil eye, a haughty spirit, and a proud soul are the marks of the disciples of Balaam the wicked. Even the sages are not immune to casting the evil eye. Witness this story in the Talmud. Quote, every 30 days, Rabbi Zera would ignite an oven, climb in it, and sit inside it to test his holiness. And the fire would not affect him on account of his great Torah erudition. One day the sages gave him the evil eye and his legs became singed in the fire." Unquote. Some have said that the story really means that you must examine yourself critically and regularly and make corrections when necessary. Even family members can cast the evil eye. Quote, 
a father and his son should not have the same name for fear of the evil eye, even if they profess not to mind. You can be a victim of the evil eye, even if you just appeared blessed. Quote, one who sells canes or jars will never see blessing from them. Why? Because their size is large, so the evil eye dominates them. That means that people believe he sells more than he actually does. It may be nearly impossible to hide your blessings. Quote, a certain woman came before Rabbi Yohanan and told him that every time she came out of the mikvah, she would see blood before she had intercourse with her husband, so they couldn't proceed. He said, maybe the gossip and evil eye of the women, the women in your city has reached you. They are jealous of the love between you and your husband. Go and immerse in the river and have intercourse with your husband on the bank of the river so that other women will not see you coming out of the mikvah." unquote. The Talmud even places restrictions on people on the assumption that they are certain to cast the evil eye. Quote, it is prohibited for a person to stand in someone else's fields and look at his crop while the grain is standing because he casts an evil eye upon it and thereby causes him damage, unquote. To counterbalance the evil eye, there is the good eye, tov ayin. It belongs to one who is satisfied with what he has and does not covet what others have. The Mishnah says, whoever possesses these three things is of the disciples of Abraham our father, a good eye, a humble spirit, and a moderate appetite. Should you seek people who have a good eye? Examples may be your parents or grandparents who will rejoice at your good fortune and not envy you for it. They may reinforce your blessings and perhaps invite more of the same. I could not find such encouragement in the sources, only exhortations to avoid the evil eye. The belief in the evil eye is that you can harm by mere thoughts. Coveting is damaging even if no action results from it. How so? Can mere thoughts harm? Is mind over matter possible? Controlled experiments in the laboratory have not verified any claims of obvious direct mind over matter effects. But this does not mean these effects are not real. There is the well-documented placebo effect. The development of new drugs against diseases requires three groups of patients. One is given nothing, a second is given the real experimental drug, and the third is given a placebo. The last two groups don't know who got what. Frequently, people given, given a placebo get better on average than people who are given nothing. To be accepted, the new drug has to show that it performs significantly better than a placebo. A lot of people will go well beyond the evil eye and translate their envy and jealousy into direct physical harm to others. Antisemitism is a prime example. Should Jews be extra modest about their achievements on the grounds that they fuel antisemitism? This is not clear since it would still be known that they deserve the credit. Should they hide them or give credit to others? That would be unrealistic. The only solution is we should be prepared to endure and fight the consequences of our good fortune. Belief in superstition is widespread and is not backed by hard science. However, this does not mean there's absolutely nothing to it. As the WAG said, I don't believe in superstitious nonsense. However, I'm given to understand it works, whether or not you believe in it. Shabbat Shalom.